know, Henry Ford once said that thinking is the hardest work there is, which is probably the reason why so few people engage in it. Hi, and I'm Robin Jackson. Welcome to another episode of Cult Life. Today's episode, I want to talk to talk to you about the two questions that got me to be an apostate. The two questions that actually put me on my journey to apostasy uh, from the Jehovah's Witness organization. Now, as a teen, um, you know, you're, you're very impressionable. Um, there's a lot of peer pressure. And more so, you know, as a, as a normal teen, there's a lot of pressure. But within uh, the Jehovah's Witness organization, um, there's a lot of pressure on you as a young person and a teenager to get baptized and to dedicate your life to Jehovah, so to speak. Now, around about the age of 10, 11, 12, most of my peers in the congregation that I grew up in um, at the time had set their sights on, on dedicating their lives to God and symbolizing it by means of baptism. And I had now surrounded myself with these friends, and I was taught that this was the right thing to do, of course. Um, you know, bad associations spoil useful habits. Everybody else outside the organization is bad association. Um, you know, and, and through the Watchtower magazines, we were taught that we should only seek and pursue friendships within the organization. And, of course, that everybody else has bad influence that will corrupt our, our young minds or corrupt anybody's mind. So I was soon on my way, following many of those young people. And I, it got to the point um, that I, at 13 years old, told my dad that I wanted to get baptized. And, of course, he was pleased, and, and we approached the elders in the congregation with my decision. Um, you know, and I took it. It was a very serious decision for me. When I was 13 years old, it was a big step for me. I, I recognized what I was doing. Um, apart from the, the pressure that gets put, put on you to actually go through and follow through with this step. So my decision was, was uh, you know, was a heartfelt one. I saw this as a big step to take and, and of course, you know, constantly was praying about it and, and, and so forth. And eventually... In June of 1983, at a Jehovah's Witness circuit, circuit assembly, I was I was baptized together with uh, a few um, of my young friends in the congregation. And as I've said before, I acknowledge that this was a serious step, and I took to memorizing the baptismal questions that was asked of every Jehovah's Witness at the time when you get baptized. And these were the questions. And the first one was, have you repented of your sins and turned around recognizing yourself before Jehovah God as a condemned sinner who needs salvation? And have you acknowledged to him that he's, that this salvation proceeds from him, the Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ? The second question was, on the basis of this faith in God and his provision for salvation, have you dedicated yourself unreservedly to God to do his, his will henceforth as he reveals it to you through Jesus Christ and through the Bible under the enlightening power of the Holy Spirit? Well, little did I know that after answering this and dedicating my young life to service in Jehovah's organization at the time. Um, little did I know that these two very questions were to sow little seeds of doubt in me, um, you know, not so long after the fact. The convictions I held, I now tried to uphold as I was baptized now. I was a baptized Jehovah's Witness and, uh, you know, tried to uphold the principles and my belief systems. So I tried to reflect that in my everyday life and in my dealings with my friends uh, at school. Before my baptism, I was enrolled on the theocratic ministry school and was in the process of being groomed and trained to be an effective public speaker, which I must admit I enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed giving talks, but I was not too fond of going out from house to house in the field ministry to preach to people. 
Um, and I don't think many Jehovah's Witnesses are. But the amount of time spent in the field ministry is recorded, and this is seen as a measure of your spirituality. So each publisher, as this is what you are known as in the, in the congregation, has a card onto which all your information is noted. And every month, each publisher has to submit a field service report to the elders. On this report, the amount of time that you spend in the house-to-house work is recorded, um, together with the amount of watchtower literature you were, um, well, at the time, we, we, we sold the literature at the time, or um, in Jehovah's Witness speak, the amount of literature we placed during that month. And every month, the watchtower featured a a certain publication that was to be used in the field ministry with a certain message linked to it. Um, you know, and after delivering this message to the householders, the publications had to be offered as a, as a Bible study aid. And this routine very, routine very often caused me to have my own little personal crisis of conscience. And I'll tell you why. Frequently, we used to preach in very poor communities here in South Africa. To those of you listening um, from our side of South Africa, um, yes, we have poverty and we and we have townships and, and you've probably seen this on television. And going into these areas to preach and to, to uh, you know, witness and to, as the Josephs call it, and then afterwards to offer a the literature to these people at the time, and of course was, was sold. Uh, we didn't ask for a donation at the time. The literature was sold. I couldn't, I couldn't get myself to do that because I went into these shacks, sat on these people's little raggedy couches, spoke to them, and I could see these people are battling to survive. How could I ask money from them when they are battling to put food on the table? How could I ask money for them, from them for a piece of literature, a magazine? That's not going to fill their, their stomachs at the end of the day. Anyway, so this was, you know, frequently my little personal crisis of conscience that I constantly had to grapple with when I used to go out and preach, do the preaching work in the in the house to house ministry, in these very, you know, very poor communities. And very often I just delivered the message and you know, um, and then walked out uh, without offering. Um, a, any of the literature. Well, the elders in the congregation now started giving us young baptized brothers these little assignments in the congregation. And this was to try and groom the young ones for appointment as ministerial servants, of course, and eventually as elders. As young males in the organization, this is what is expected of you to strive for. You you know, it, it's, all, it's constantly... Uh, you know, drilled into you, you young ones reach out and do more in the service of Jehovah is what the organization constantly tells its young ones. Well, my standpoint and my convictions at the time, um, you know, I was making known to my classmates and, and witnessing at school, as I said. Um, and, you know, I was, I was very diligent in this. However, um, Two years later, 1985, as a 15-year-old, I experienced my next crisis of consciousness. And I think this was the, um, the first real big alarm bell for me and that actually set in motion, um, you know, as I was growing up in the, in the organization. Those alarm bells don't ever go away um, but this was the first alarm bell. And this is what happened. I was sitting, this is 1985, as a 15-year-old. Um, I was sitting sitting at a, another Joe's Witness convention, listening to the baptismal talk at an assembly, um, whereby the next bunch of, of Joe's Witnesses that were now being baptized um, was about to stand up and, and, and answer the two questions um, that is asked of them. Uh, by the speaker before they get baptized. And at the end of the talk, when the first baptismal question was asked, it sounded somewhat different. Now, two years before, I remember I had actually 
you know, memorize these questions because it was a big step for me. So I listened very closely and I and I listened to the second question. The second question, the first question was very similar to the first that I knew, um, you know, it to be. It was structured a little bit different. But the second question went something like this. It says, do you understand that your dedication and baptism identify you as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in association with God's Spirit-directed organization? That was the question that was now asked. I sat there and I thought, say that again? Baptism is now into God's organization? What happened to salvation through God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit? And this is what I thought. I sat there and I looked around and looking at the people next to me and, you know, just checking if I'm the only one hearing this. Well, I left it at that and then, you know, back at the congregation, your home congregation, the following week, I approached an elder and uh, I asked him, whether the baptismal questions have changed. And he suggested that I look it up in the Watchtower magazine of uh, June the 1st, 1985. And sure enough, there it was on page 30. And the questions were as follows now. On the basis of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, have you repented of your sins and dedicated yourself to do his will? And the second question now said, do you understand that your dedication and baptism identify you as one of Joe's witnesses in association with God's spirit-directed organization. I now try to suppress the questions that came up in my mind. Was I the only one experiencing this conflict of thought and reasoning? My baptism was to do God's will and not into an organization was my reasoning. So those two little questions... Little did I know that they were the very first alarm bell that actually got me on my, or set me on my journey and set me on the path of apostasy from the Jehovah's Witnesses. And eventually, 25 years later, 25 years later, after that first alarm bell went off, I left Jehovah's Witnesses because all the other alarm bells, all the other questions, all the other doctrinal flip-flops and the 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 reasoning that I couldn't reconcile with the teachings I couldn't reconcile the teachings with uh, you know the bible standards that were set forth at the time and so forth I couldn't and it all came to a head and all bottled up and of course 25 years later I left the Jehovah's Witnesses and I say this because you know there's Many of you will will be able to relate. You have these little alarm bells that come up in your mind during a talk, during a convention, at one of the talks at the conventions or at your congregation. And you are taught to suppress this because you're not allowed to question um, the authority of the governing body. You're not allowed to question the authority or the doctrine from the Watchtower organization. Everything that is written in the publications is law. Everything that is set out in the literature um, is what goes. That is what goes. It is only when the governing body decides to change a doctrine that it's okay. And they use this under the guise of new light. And that's a discussion for another time because new light changing your doctrine and changing it now, you know, saying, no, this is what's actually happened. New light to me is, in my opinion, sorry, governing body, you lied to us before. You've changed the doctrine to suit your doctrine, to suit your teachings. You've changed the writings to suit your, um, your agenda. And in my opinion, new light is lies. All right, But I just wanted to talk about these two little questions um, from my experience that set me on the path of apostasy and my eventual exit 
from the Jehovah's Witnesses. 13 years old, um, got baptized, 1983. Two years later, as a 15-year-old, I, looking back, I realize now that was the very first crisis of conscience I had as a 15-year-old and what set me on my journey to apostasy. Thank you for listening. And that's the show for this evening. Until next week, have a good one. Bye for now.